Amen. Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and turn to the book of Mark, the book of Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, we're going to look at the faith that pleases God. The faith that God looks for is the faith that pleases God. I have two bottles of water. I guess I'm going to be a heavy drinker today. I'm not sure what that means, but uh, anyway, I'm going to put this one back here. Thank you. Uh, if you remember the last message, we've kind of taken the end of Mark chapter 11, and we're splitting it into three messages. The last message was on the withered fig tree and how Jesus had cursed it and it was dried up from the roots up, and it was symbolic of dead religion, of the fact that Israel had failed to fulfill her purposes, that the Temple Mount and all the sacrifices had become meaningless because Jesus had shown up and they did not even recognize the Son of God. And so Jesus curses this fig tree and he does it because it was hypocritical. It was giving a testimony that it was bearing fruit, but in fact, it was barren. It was an application to Israel, but Jesus quickly moves from this into a statement that we ended with in the last message, have faith in God. What Jesus is doing in the Gospel of Mark is giving examples and illustrations and examples and illustrations and parables and miracles that talk about we can trust God. Whether it's on the shore or in the storm, whether it's an obstacle or a spiritual battle, whether it is a mountain, which he will look at today, or a problem, all of these things require the same thing. They require a faith response. When we come up against a mountain in our lives, an obstacle in our lives, something that seems immovable or impossible, it requires of us a faith response. And so in chapter 11, in verse 23, 22 and 23, Jesus answered saying to them, have faith in God. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. Therefore, in light of what I've just said, therefore, I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask believe that you have received them and they will be granted you. So the first thing Jesus says is that we are to have faith in God. This is foundational. This is fundamental. But remember who he's talking to. He, he's talking to people who have put their faith by not accurately interpreting the the messages and the prophecies of Messiah, they put their faith in that when Messiah shows up, there's going to be a political kingdom and that Messiah would overthrow Rome and that he would rule and reign. That will happen one day. This was not the time. There were two comings. This was the one when he came as a servant and as a suffering savior. It's also having faith in God means don't put your faith in a system. Some people think if I check all the boxes, if I dot the I's and cross the T's, if I walk the straight line, then God will approve of me and give me whatever I want. What he says is, boil your life down to this statement. Have faith in God. Live by faith. Now, when he's talking about a mountain, it was very possible that he was looking at the mount of the temple, the temple mount. And he was looking at that and said, one day that's going to be gone. And in fact, it would be. It would be. It would be. The temple would be destroyed. It was a symbol without substance. It had become corrupt. And Jesus is trying to help his disciples as they move forward to not put their faith in systems, in religion, in formulas, not even to put their faith in faith or even to put their faith in prayer, but have faith in God. Faith is only as strong as its object. 
Look at this definition of faith. It is the leaning of the entire human personality upon God in absolute trust and confidence in his power, his wisdom, and his goodness. Leaning on God. Have faith in God. Literally, constantly be trusting in God. Don't have faith one day and lose it the next. Stay faithful and have faith in God because that kind of faith can move mountains. That which seems immovable, impossible, set in concrete, permanently established. So Jesus is saying that mountain-moving faith operates in the realm of prayer. If we want to have the kind of faith that deals with the obstacles and problems and issues in our lives, it operates in the realm of prayer. And so one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves when we're facing bad news, crisis, pandemic, whatever it is, one of the things we have to ask ourselves is, do we take our problem to God? Now, there's a difference between taking your problem to God and taking your problem to God's people. Nothing wrong with taking your problem to God's people, but don't ask God's people to do what you're not doing. Don't ask God's people to take your problem to God. If you're not taking your problem to God, well, I'm just so grateful all those people are praying for me. Are you praying? That's the question here. Do, are you operating in the realm of faith that God is the one who sees and knows? Now, here's where we get into a battle with the devil. And the devil begins to play on us in this point. And he begins to attack us. And, and the devil will start whispering in your ear. Now, this may not happen to you. You may be so spiritual. This has never happened to you. But this happened to me. Why isn't God answering? So the devil just whispers in your ear and says, Well, I guess you're not important enough for God to listen to you. Why isn't God answering? How could God let this happen to you? Where was God when you needed him? All that praying, and you still don't have an answer. And he'll just wind that up, and he will feed that. And if you listen to his voice instead of the still, small voice of God, you will become unraveled. And the mountain will overwhelm you. You see, if Satan can distort your image of God, he can detour, detour your faith in God. Because if he gets you to believe that God doesn't see and God doesn't know and God doesn't care and God's got other things to do besides worry about you, then he will make your faith go on a detour. And you'll get off the track that God wants you on. Verse 22, have faith. Verse 23, does not doubt. That does not doubt means is not in conflict with oneself. I'm not in conflict with myself. I'm not at odds with myself. I'm not confused about how God works and who he is. Here's an important thought. Doubts may enter your mind, but don't entertain them. Doubts may enter your mind, but don't entertain them. Doubt will come knocking on the door of your heart, but you don't have to let him in and give him a Coke and a, and a bag of popcorn. You don't have to entertain doubts. Doubts are going to come. It's a part of life. But don't entertain it. Verse 24, pray and ask and believe. Be fearless in prayer and be faithful to prevail. Pray, ask, believe. This is kingdom praying. This is how the children of the king are supposed to pray. And this is not the first time that Jesus has said something like this. For he said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You just got to figure out, is that mountain something I've created or is it something God has allowed? Because my goal is to glorify God and to build up his kingdom. So here's the kind of faith we need. We need a faith that reckons Reckoning is an accounting term that, that adds up what God has said and believes it. We reckon on God. We take God at his word. 
You see, what God says is absolute, but it must be appropriated. It's one thing to know I, God said it, but I have to appropriate that in my life. I have to make it true in my life. Have faith in God. Reckon that if God said it, it's true, and that settles it whether I have doubts or fears or not. Secondly, rest. Rest in the promises of God. God didn't make his promises for every God didn't make his promises for everyone but you. Rest in the promises of God. The promises of God are yes and amen. God honors his word. He does not change his mind. What is written in scripture is true, has been, will always be true. And then risk. Risk. Step out and trust God in what he says. If God says it, then sow it in prayer and reap it in power. Sow it in prayer. I, Lord, you've said this. I, I reckon that what you say is true. Reckon is a good word other than an accounting word. I reckon that's good. Uh, I reckon that you say it's true. I rest in what you say in the promises in God. And I'm going to take out and step out in a risk to believe that you're going to do what you said you're going to do. So we step out. We think God's thoughts after him. That's a good way of thinking about your praying and your acting in faith. You think God's thoughts after him. You didn't come up with that idea. God came up with that idea. So act on God's idea. Your idea gets you in a lot of trouble. My ideas get me in a lot of trouble. Act on God's ideas. So have faith in God. Then say to this mountain, this is where faith risks. Because if you say to this mountain, you're making a declaration of your faith. There's a confession of faith, but there's also a command of faith. Well, I believe that God can do anything. I believe in the promises of God. I reckon the truth of God to be so. Well, there's a command here. Say to this mountain, have faith in God, command. Say to this mountain, it's a command. Verse 23, and it shall be granted him. NIV says, are done for him. You see, we're not instructed to ignore the problem. We're to face the problem. I mean, some people want to run from their problems, and so they think if I move to another town, I won't have that problem. Guess what? They, that problem knows where your forwarding address is. They think, if it, you know, if I just, if I change this, if I change that, the problem will go away. Problems are problems, and problems are everywhere. There is no place that you can run from problems. The only people not worrying about problems right now are in the cemetery. That's the only ones. So, consider the problem. But don't take the problem into consideration. In other words, I'm not, I'm not saying that Jesus is saying live in denial. That's not really a mountain. It's a mountain. It's a problem. It's, it's big enough that it's got your attention. Consider the problem, but don't take the problem into consideration. You see, when you and I focus on the mountain, we lose our focus on God. When we start just looking at the mountain and looking at the mountain and looking at the mountain, we, we lose our focus on God. Yeah, you ever met anybody that all they ever talk about is their mountains? I mean, it's always their problems. You know, how you doing? And then you, you better have a couple hours because they're going to tell you. They're going to they're gonna start with their little toe, and then they're going to go to the big toe, and then they're going to hit their ankle, and then it's going to be their knees and their back, and then it's going to be this and that. And it's going to be their checking account. It, it's going to be their, their kids. It's going to be their wife. It's going to be their dog. It's going to be their cat. It's going to be their job. I mean, they just keep going on and on and on. And that's when you learn to pray a different prayer. Lord, I am ready to enter into your presence. Because all they do is talk about their problem. The thing you need to do is say, well, what are you doing about it? Well, I just, you, know, you know, so are you praying about it? 
Do you believe that God can fix it? Do you believe that God can change it? I said to someone on the phone the other day, I said, do you realize that God knows every pig pen that every prodigal is in? They are not off of his GPS. He knows where they are. You may not know where they are, but he knows where they are. So take your problem to God. Say to this mountain. See, God has the last word. Now, let me, let me help you here for a minute. The reality is our problems are not really our problems. Now, that's important because of what the next statement is going to be. Our problems are not really our problems. Our problem is our attitude about our problems. The problem is not our problem. The problem is our attitude about our problem. I've watched people go through major crisis and, and just their attitude is one of faith and confidence that the Lord sees and hears and knows and cares. And I've watched people go through lesser things and they think God has evacuated the premises. You see, our problem is not our problem. Our problem is our attitude toward our problem. Say, well, my problem is my husband. No, it's your attitude towards your husband. Because God can't work if your mind is messed up. Well, my problem are my kids. My kids just won't listen. No, you, your problem is you're neither not listening to the promises of God, obeying the promises of God, and you're dealing with the results of that. It's your attitude towards your problem. Well, my problem is I'm up to my ears in credit card debt. No, that's not the problem. The problem is you thought you could spend your way into wealth. The problem is you thought that you'd never have to pay for that credit card. Or the problem is that you've been putting your hamburgers and your Chick-fil-A on your credit card and paying minimum payments, and you're paying 18% interest, and your credit card bill keeps going up, and you want God to fix it. And I would just suggest to you, Quit paying 18% interest on a $5 meal. Your problems are your attitude. You can just keep doing it and then come to the church and ask us for money or you could maybe just eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for a while until you can pay it off. You see, it's your attitude towards your problem. Do you think that God sees? Do you think God knows? And do you think God cares about your problem? Or is it just more fun for you and for me, just to whine about our problems. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, and he said, you, you know, every time he gets up, he, if I mention his name, you'd know it, but he said every time he gets up, he goes, oh, mm. he said, you know, my, Michael, I'm going to be 85 this year. He said, I get out of bed, I go, oh. He said, I get up, I go, mm. and I, I just kind of move around, ah, get in the car. Mm. And he said, my wife said, honey, you need me to call the doctor? He said, no. Moaning is my love language. <laughs> and for some of us, moaning and complaining is our love language. You see, we have become so subnormal in the way we relate to God that to be normal, we would appear to be abnormal. We're so subnormal that our first thought is not of God and his sufficiency and his grace and his power. Our first thought is of our problem, of the mountain. And we're not supposed to just look at the mountain and say, look, there's a mountain. We're supposed to speak to it. We're supposed to speak to it. Say to this mountain, and it shall be granted to you. So we stand on God's promises, verse 24. Literally, believe that you already have it, and you shall have it. This is an aorist tense. It's a certainty. There's an assurance to it. Williams translates it, believe it has been granted to you and you will get it. Phillips translates it, paraphrases it, believe that you will have received it and it will be yours. Hit the pause button. Jesus is not endorsing the name it, claim it, prosperity gospel. Jesus is not saying, whatever you want, you will get. Because this command and this illustration is still in the context of your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is not about telling God what you want. 
It's about you getting an agreement by faith in prayer with what God wants. And you see, because we as Baptists are so afraid of extremities, we fail to appropriate the power and the promises of God. Because we think, if I say, if I say to somebody, I'm believing that God's going to move that mountain, they say, when would you become Pentecostal? How about just when did you become biblical? The Bible says you have not because you ask not. So when, when do we pray and when do we ask God? This is not a blank check. Here's, here's my Christmas list, Jesus, and I've been a good boy and you better give me everything on this list. Or the one thing I'm going to talk about on Christmas morning is the one thing I didn't get. That's not what this is. This is about prayer and faith in the context of living out the life of Christ in this world. This is not about religion. This is not about system. It's about the purposes and principles of God. Now, you think about it. Several years ago, I did a, a series on miracles. And, and when you think about it, you look at stories in the Bible. They're not very pragmatic especially in a cynical culture like we live in in the United States. They're not pragmatic. I mean, the, the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear. People are raised from the dead. Now, the, Jesus is doing it. By the way, all those people ended up dying. There's nobody on a speaking tour in churches that's 2,000 years old and say, yeah, I you know, I'm running in the Boston Marathon this year. You know, I was lame and Jesus healed me. Have you ever seen a 2,000-year-old man? No, he died. He eventually died. They all died. But the power of the gospel to change lives, to just change a nation, to change the Roman Empire, to spread, it, it doesn't make sense outside of faith and prayer. Nothing that Jesus did makes sense in the Gospels outside of faith and prayer. They went to Jesus for healing because they believed that he could because they had heard he had done it with someone else. Now, was everyone in the nation of Israel healed? No, but many were. Have faith in prayer. You see, what doesn't make sense to me is not a problem to a sovereign God. Now, that's important for us to understand. It may not make sense to me why God does some things and he doesn't do other things. Why it seems he moves that person's mountain, but he hadn't moved my mountain. Maybe he hadn't moved it yet. Maybe you've quit too soon. But whatever your mountain is, it is not so big that a sovereign God is sending you an email or a text message right now say, sorry, bud, I don't have that much power. You're never going to get that from the Lord. If God says wait or no, it is because he has a bigger plan than we have and one that we do not understand. Uh, North American Mission Board did a... Uh, did a video on uh, Malachi Russell's life this year. This is the year, this week was the year ago he, that he died. And Malachi had made a list of 17 people he wanted to see saved. And, you know, here's what we've forgotten as a church. Here's how quickly we forget. We prayed. We wanted Malachi to be healed. God had a different plan. But on that video that the North American Mission Board filmed a month ago, over 100 people have come to Christ because of Malachi's life. And in 24 hours after that video was posted, 28,000 people had viewed it. So I would ask myself the question, when have I been so surrendered to the will of God that 28,000 people wanted to view something about me? See, God had a bigger purpose. None of us liked it. We would have loved to have had a different result, especially his family. But at the end of the day, God is, has to be glorified. And we live for the glory of God, not for the relief of our problems. 
You see, God doesn't look down and see our mountains and say, I am so sorry. I was over here paying attention to these people over here, and I had no idea that you folks had some mountains that you were dealing with. I'm sorry that t- t- just slipped up on me. Uh, let me get that out of your way. God knows the mountains. God knows the issues. God knows the problems. The life of faith means we're going to have opposition and we're going to have struggles. And faith and prayer does not mean if I just berate God long enough, he'll say, I am so tired of you berating me over this. Yes, I'll deal with it. You know what that would do? That would make God our servant. And we are his servants. God is not our servant at our beck and call to do whatever we want him to do. Of all that Jesus said about prayer, this is the most uncompromising, the most non-negotiable. He's asking us, now this is important, please don't miss this. He's asking us to believe before we see. Now anybody can believe after they see. But he's asking us to believe before we see that the Father will back up the promises of the Son. I love what Vance Hebner said. Vance Hebner said, I don't understand all about electricity, but I'm not going to sit around in the dark until I figure it out. He also said, I don't know how a brown cow can eat green grass and give white milk, but I'm going to drink it. You can't figure it all out. You can't understand. It's bigger than you because it's God's size. John 14, 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me The works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. You see, prayer doesn't change God's plans. Prayer gets us in on God's plans. Prayer doesn't change God's plans. It gets us in. God wants to get us in in what he's doing on earth as it is in heaven. And to believe God is to obey God. So if you put John 14 and Mark 11 where we are today side by side, it's having faith in God, it's praying, but here's the deal, okay? Here's the catch-all. Here's the uh, small print in the contract, if you will. If there's an area in my life where I am willfully and knowingly disobeying God, then why would he move a mountain for a disobedient child? Get your obedience in line, then we'll talk about the mountain. Lord, uh, we, we've got this health issue. We've got this financial issue. We've got this marriage issue. We've got this. Well, uh, what about your tithing? Well, I didn't come to you to talk about that, Lord. I've already made up my mind. I just bought a boat, so I don't have the money to tithe. And, and I just, you know, I don't have this. And I, Listen, you cannot compartmentalize your life and get God to move a mountain. That's just the bottom line. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord? Lord, and do not the things that I say. The problem is we know when we are disobeying God in an area of our life. And yet a problem comes up, we're in a hospital room, we're, we're in a nursing home, we're, we're somewhere and the, the walls are caving in on us and we say, oh God, please move this mountain. God say, well, I've been trying to talk to you for about 30 years about something you hadn't paid attention the first time, but now you want me when you're in a problem. Listen, God is not your bellboy. Have faith in God means, oh, you mean God said that? Then that's what I need to do. You say, biblically, faith and prayer eliminate the possibility of a compartmentalized life. I can't have God over here and self right here and then go to God and say, ignore what I'm doing on my own, living like I please, but give me what I'm asking you for. It's got to be surrender. Verse 13 that I will do, not I'll help you, but I will do. Notice that Jesus doesn't say, I'll help you do it. He says, 
I will do it. Heaven is waiting for us, for the one who believes in him, that he is from the Father, that the Father and the Son are one. Faith is the operating principle. We live by faith. We walk by faith. We're saved by faith. We please God by faith. By faith, all things are possible to him who believes. We resist the devil by faith. Faith is active, not passive. It's active. Our faith is an action word. In John 14, verse 12, where he talks about works, that isn't in the original, literally, and greater It's a reference to them and to us. They would do greater things, we would. Verse 13, whatever. The greater works of verse 12 are the results of the prayers in verse 13. You want to see God do great works in your life? Get your prayer and your faith on the same page with God. Williams translates this, Yes, I repeat it, anything you ask, As bearers of my name, I will do it for you. Six times in John 14 through 17, six times Jesus says, If you ask, I will. There is no other name but the name of Jesus that activates the Spirit of God. There is no other name but the name of Jesus that moves mountains. It's not Baptist, it's not your name, it's not your friend's name, it's not anything you have. It's the name of Jesus, and that's not using it, that's living it out in our lives in a power that has been made available to us. Think about it. John 14 and Mark 11, bad time to bring up these great, wonderful principles, because in a few days, Jesus is going to be dead. I mean, if I was going to bring up mountain-moving faith, I would have done it right after the feeding of the 5,000. I would have done it right after walking on water. If I was going to bring up mountain-moving faith, I would have done it at a moment when the crowd was up and high and everything was moving in his direction and the opposition hadn't formed yet. And I'd say, now's the time, guys. Let's go while the getting's good. Jesus did it in the shadow of the cross And in the shadow of the cross, he said, there is a glimpse that I'm going to give you in the power that you are going to have in the Holy Spirit by faith in prayer that is going to revolutionize this world. Mark 11, 24, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them and they will be granted to you. It, it's again, it's aorist tense. Pray in such a way that you believe you have already received the answer that you are asking for. Believe and receive. One is I-E, the other one is E-I. It, you know what? It's hard for us to claim the promises and it's hard for us to receive the answer. But until we get in the same realm with the Lord, it's hard for us to receive that he's really speaking to us. Oh, he's speaking to everybody else but us. We pray and we aren't sure. We hear, but we doubt. But can I tell you an important spiritual principle? Receiving is just as much a part of faith as asking. Receiving is is just as much a part of faith as asking. Not just ask, receive. Your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There is a power that is not my own that is available to me to face the mountains that stand in front of me. John Hunter said, one of the sorrows of counseling with Christians is to meet people who have all the answers doctrinally, but who cannot face the practical problems of daily living and daily suffering. So I just want to ask you two questions. What's your mountain? Let me ask you three. What's your mountain? Where's your faith? And how's your prayer life? What's your mountain? Where's your faith? How's your prayer life? Let's pray together.
Father, there's not a one of us in this room that are not either coming out of a problem, in a problem, or headed to a problem. And the mountains can be overwhelming to us. And so I ask you to get us to a point where we are not looking at the mountains, we are looking to you. We are not focused on the problems, we are focused on the possibilities that come by faith. Lord, we don't know what to do at times, so our eyes are on you. We don't have all the answers, and we seem to be consumed by our problems, but it's not the problem, it's the attitude toward the problem. We honestly don't pray because we don't believe you can change it. We don't believe you can fix it. We don't believe you can restore it. We don't believe you can meet us in our dark valleys, in our desperate situations. And so we turn to this world and look for answers that the world cannot give. Lord, I know dead religion can't give the answer. Systems and formulas can't give the answer, but I do know that there's a God in heaven and a Son who stands at His right hand and a Spirit that dwells within us and a Scripture that we hold in our hands, and that is the source of our sufficiency when we face the mountains. Lord, the mountains keep us from seeing you. So whatever it is that keeps us from seeing you, teach us how to deal with it and pray it through so that in the end we see you high and lifted up. In Jesus' name, amen. encourage you to sign on. Um, our pastor is going through this new series called Relentless, and we are walking through Daniel. It is a powerful study. I encourage you to sign on. That is at 6 p.m. And then next Sunday, we have a treat. We have a treat. Tom Elif is going to be here next Sunday, and then also we will have a live Sunday service at the p.m. 
with Tom Elif. And so I encourage you and invite people to come and be a part of that. That is the final announcement. So our ushers are going to move into place. As they uh, move into place, they'll give you instructions on exiting. Thank you for worshiping with us today and your patience. <laughs>